Hey, Nico here, and I'm at the Starfront Observatories in Central Texas. For anyone that's seen the previous videos in my series of observatory tours, this one's gonna be a little bit different. And this isn't a personal backyard observatory. These are big buildings. They're commercial remote observatories uh, run by this new company, Starfront Observatories. And inside, there are a bunch of individuals' telescopes. So basically the idea here is that if you have a telescope, a camera, a mount, all the accessories needed for it to work, you ship all of that down here. They set it up on a custom pier and connect it to the internet and power, and then you have complete control over your telescope, but it's inside one of these observatories. And the big advantage to this is that we're under a Bortle 1 very dark uh, sky where it's clear much of the year. And so for me, the biggest draw wasn't actually the dark skies because I moved to a place in New Hampshire for dark skies, but it was the clear skies because in New England, we haven't been getting a lot of clear weather. And as someone who does this full time, I thought it would be really nice to have a telescope where it's clear more often. So I signed up for Starfront Observatories after it was announced. I picked the uh, least expensive option, the smallest telescope, $200 a month. And I thought for that price, I think it's definitely gonna be worth trying out. After I signed up, Brave Falls, who is one of the people that runs this, reached out to me and asked if I wanted to come down and do a tour, which I definitely did. So that's why I'm down here and I wanna take you along for the journey. So maybe if you're interested in uh, signing up for Starfront, this will give you a little bit more information about what's going on down here. So let's get started. I'm here with uh, Bray Falls and Josh Kim, who run the Starfront Observatories. So I've never done remote imaging before. What are the advantages and disadvantages of remote imaging for astrophotography rather than like the way that I've always done it in my backyard? So the advantages of remote imaging is that you get more time on sky per year in a place that's dark. You don't have to deal with setup problems. You don't have to deal with worrying about where your telescope is. And in some cases, um, if you don't even have a backyard, like I think most people probably don't have backyards where they can actually set up and you, you're living in an apartment, it's the most cost effective way to actually do remote. Because if you want to go and drive to a dark sky site, you obviously can't do that for 365 days a year. But if you have a remote observatory, it's every night, it's always in the dark sky site, and it's basically mimicking what the professionals do. And why Starfront? So what, what, what makes this one different than other remote observatories and uh, what was sort of the genesis of it? So for us, you know, the, the mission was super simple. Um, we wanted to make, you know, world-class dark skies available and accessible for everyone. There are rem other remote observatories, you know, and, and oftentimes the monthly cost to have your system in a place like that is uh, too high for, for most folks. And so for us, like our mission was to really drive down that price, make it more accessible and more affordable for people so that we can expand the audience, you know, expand the number of customers and, and people that can actually um, use this service and be able to explore, you know, the cosmos from an incredibly dark side anytime, you know, it's clear out. Actually, I have a follow up on that. So how do you how are you more affordable than everyone else? What, what are the cost saving measures you're you're doing? All right. So the main cost saving measure is the idea that there's a there's a correlation between the size of the telescope and how much it costs. So for the average, most popular consumer telescopes are going to be small refractors, perhaps on a harmonic mount like a AM5, AM3. These are systems that honestly don't require space, like how things are spaced out at existing remote observatories where you'll have multiple, you know, five, six plus feet for one telescope. Those places are all spaced out for people with big plane waves, like higher end clients. And we can afford to lower prices just by building the observatory around these smaller systems and accommodating them specifically because you can just fit more of them in one building. At home, I was able to pour a concrete pier. I know there are sort of like 
commercial off the shelf steel piers people buy, but these are custom steel piers. So tell me a little bit about the process of making them here on site and why you're going with custom steel piers. For, for us, I mean, it's just the uh, possibility for us to do that. I mean, we obviously have an incredible diverse array of systems that custom uh, customers are looking to ship out here. And for us to be as responsive as we can and be as individually tailored as we can, we uh, we custom machine uh, all the all the parts that uh, that we can on site so that we can make it as uh, unique and individualized for a person's system as possible. So this is obviously a roll-off uh, roof design. We just saw the roofs roll off, but it's a little bit different than other ones I've seen. Um, they're rolling off to the south. And so tell me about w what decisions were made and, and how they were made with the design of these. And trying to find a good place to roll the roof out, there's never a good direction that is ideal. It always sucks trying to, to find that placement. The reason we decided to go to the south one, we wanted people to have the most time visibility for when things rise and when things set. So for things like transient events, like comets or other objects, you need like a low east-west. And so that's why uh, our observatories have a low four-foot wall on the east-west. So you basically have a zero-degree horizon in this regard. For the south, uh, at the worst possible angle currently on the south end of the building, you can hit most of the popular uh, Milky Way core targets like Lagoon, Trifid, and Ro Ophiuchi, but we are gonna be backing the roofs up a bit further because there are some elusive targets. We also want people to be able to get like uh, Cat's Paw, War and Peace, those kinds of objects. So tell me about the whole process of getting started at Starfront. So if someone is interested in sending their telescope down here, what's the first step, the second step, the third step to the point where they're actually imaging here? So kind of the first step is we suggest everyone to go to our website and we have some informational stuff here about what a remote system looks like in general, as well as the breakdown of the pricing tiers we have for our systems. So the one thing to keep in mind usually is how big an actual system is because our pricing is motivated by the how many scopes we can fit into one building. So the more space it'll consume, the higher the price it will be. So for these larger systems that you'll have, you'll want to check the list on our website to figure out what your actual tier is for your system. And then once you know this, you can submit a reservation, which is just a one month refundable deposit to secure a spot. And then you'll prepare a shipment for your, for your system. So we're in touch for customer support for anything like preparing your telescope, getting it ready to get sent out here and arranging for the packages to get delivered. All that will be handled. So once the telescope is actually sent in, then we install it, drill it into the ground. So I'm back home in New Hampshire and I've now been remote imaging at Starfront for about a week. So I'm controlling my telescope here in New Hampshire, but it's down in Texas. And so I thought it'd be good to wrap up this video with my initial impressions of Starfront and remote imaging in general. Of course, everything is very fresh and exciting to me right now. So don't take this as a review. It's really just initial impressions of what remote imaging at Starfront is like. I'll admit that my biggest worry with remote imaging was that it would be boring <laughs> because I'm someone who likes fiddling with telescopes hands on, you know, actually touching them. <laughs> but so far I've been pretty engaged. I, I haven't set up anything to run automatically. So I'm actually logging on to my computer out there over Chrome remote desktop every night and turning everything on, planning my whole night out and watching the subs come in. And that alone to me as an astro nerd is thrilling. But then Starfront has an added bonus of a pretty active Discord community. So all the other imagers who have their telescopes out there are all chatting and sharing pictures and advice on Discord, uh, which I think adds a lot of fun. And you can think of this almost as like a 
virtual star party every night. And when I say every night, I mean every night. <laughs> because every night since my telescope was installed out there, it has been clear skies, which is something I'm still getting accustomed to. It's very different than here on the East Coast, where I'd be lucky to get seven clear nights in two or three months. And the last time I had a string of clear nights like that was 2019, so five years ago now. Um, now, that's not to say that I won't still be imaging from home here in New England. Any clear night I get, I'm going to be out in my backyard observatory that I built that I called the Paper Birch Observatory. And actually, I've already had the experience now of imaging concurrently from my backyard and in Texas remotely at the same time. And that was really cool. The only thing that was weird about that was that I was running three instances of Sequence Generator Pro, which is the software that I use to control everything. And it was pretty easy to get them mixed up and thinking, wait, I just hit slew. Why isn't my telescope moving? And then realizing, oh, <laughs> it's out in Texas. Of course, I can't hear it slewing. Uh, it's, it's not here physically. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a <laughs> something to get used to. And it's only been a week, but so far it's been very smooth sailing with my remote rig. Nothing has gone terribly wrong. Uh, the one thing I would say I'm very glad I have on that rig is the Pegasus Ultimate Power Box, where you can switch off and on both each 12 volt power port, but also each USB port through their Unity software. And you, you just have to make sure to label them in the software so you know which one you're turning off and on. Um, because I've had devices already out in Texas just become unresponsive. And if I was at home, I would just do the simple thing of unplug, plug it back in, and it works. Um, but now all I have to do is I just hit the little, little software switch to turn it off and on. And that's been working great to get devices to show up again if for some reason they're acting funny. Now, you technically could ask the staff at Starfront to cycle uh, devices for you, like I'm doing with the Pegasus. And small troubleshooting things like that are included in your monthly peer rental fee. Um, and they have a really nice ticketing system on Discord that I've tested. It seems to work quite well. But uh, keep in mind, they are currently looking after about 20 to 25 systems out there. And they plan to scale this to hundreds of telescopes with the buildings getting much fuller. And um, they're also pl already planning a, an additional two buildings. So my point is, uh, the more... Uh, little troubleshooting things that you can do on your own, like cycling ports with a Pegasus power box, I think the better off you'll be. You know, you, you can send in a support ticket for something that small and they're, they're going to take care of it. Um, but keep in mind that, uh, you know, th these buildings are going to be very full and they, they're, the piers are bolted to the concrete floor. So they're not wanting to go into the observatory buildings at night when the roof is off and it's clear for imaging, unless it's like a, an emergency. So you would probably lose out on a night of imaging if you're relying on the staff at Starfront to take care of troubleshooting through their ticket system. Um, well, if it's something that you can just control over the internet, then you can be back in business right away, which is what I've found. Like I've run into little troubleshooting things. I just cycle a device and it's it's back and I can get on with my imaging. So you might wonder, what's my general impression of Starfront Observatories after visiting it for a week? Um, they seem to have really good intentions. I think they do believe in the mission of, you know, seeing if they can push the cost curve of remote imaging down through scale, through having lots of small telescopes in each building. It's a new business, so of course they're figuring things out as they go. Things change, uh, and you you know you hear about new things going on with networking and different things. But you can find out almost anything that's going on at the observatories by being active in the Discord, and uh, they've been really good about communication there. Um, and I should say there's lots of experience in building and managing observatories and telescopes and all of that on this team. So I feel good enough about it that I'm paying to host my telescope there. I'm not getting any kickbacks or anything. I'm, I'm paying full fare. And uh, hopefully through this video, you could get an impression for, you know, what it's like. Uh, that's why I made it. Uh, but I'd also be happy to answer questions from my perspective if you want to reach out to me. Of course, Starfront, you can reach out to them directly too. I'll plan on doing a follow-up to this after six months or a year. 
um, when I feel like I had more experience and give a more full review of uh, what it's like after some time has passed. But I'll leave you uh, for this video with the two images I've processed so far from Starfront. You already saw this one of IC4604. It's part of the Ro Ophiuchi Cloud Complex in Scorpio, very famous area of the sky because you have that yellow, yellow orangish reflection nebula from Antares, so it's very beautiful. Um, but then I'm mostly focusing on the blue reflection nebula in that cloud complex. And then here's the other image. This is Comet 13P Olbers that Bray Falls alerted me to when I was visiting. And uh, I have to credit the exceptional dark skies at Starfront because it's very hard to bring out uh, comet tails when they're this faint and, and when they're this low in the sky, unless you have really excellent dark skies. So it, it still was a bit of processing work, but the, the dark skies made this image really uh, possible. So this was another treat for my first week of going remote as a cool comet image uh, to boot. So that's it for this one. Until next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies.